Hi, my sweet friends, and welcome back to Crochet Every Day with Judy. We are reading again from a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, starting today with Chapter 10, Beginnings of Civilization. The round table soon heard of the challenge, and of course it was a good deal discussed, for such things interest, interested the boys. <clears throat> the king thought I ought now to set forth in quest of adventures, so that I might gain renown and be the more worthy to meet Sir Sagramore when the several years should have rolled away. I excused myself for the present. I said it would take me three or four years yet to get things well fixed up and going smoothly. Then I should be ready. All the chances were that at the end of that time, Sir Sagramore would still be out grailing, so no valuable time would be lost by the postponement. <clears throat> I should then have been in office for six or seven years, and I believed my system and machinery would be so well developed that I could take a holiday without its working any harm. <clears throat> Excuse me. I was pretty well satisfied with what I had already accomplished. In various quiet nooks and corners, I had the beginnings of all sorts of industries underway. Nuclei of future vast factories, the, the iron and steel missionaries of my future civilization. In these were gathered together the brightest young minds I could find, and I kept agents out raking the country for more all the time. I was training a crowd of ignorant folk into experts, experts in every sort of handiwork and scientific calling. These nurseries of mine went smoothly and privately along, undisturbed in their obscure country retreats, for nobody was allowed to come into their precincts without a special permit, for I was afraid of the church. I had started a teacher factory and a lot of Sunday schools the first thing. As a result, I now had an, ad an admirable system of graded schools in full blast in those places, and also a complete variety of Protestant congregations, all in a prosperous and growing condition. Everybody could be any kind of a Christian he wanted to. There was perfect freedom in that matter. But I confined public religious teaching to the churches and the Sunday schools, permitting nothing of it in my other educational buildings. I could have given my own sect the preference and made everybody a Presbyterian without any trouble. But that would have been to affront a law of human nature. Spiritual wants and instincts are as various in the human family as our physical appearances, I'm sorry, physical appetites, complexions, and features, and a man is only at his best morally when he is equipped with the religious garment whose color and shape and size most nicely accommodate themselves to the spiritual complexion, angularities, and stature of the individual who wears it. <clears throat> And besides, I was afraid of a united church. It makes a mighty power, the mightiest conceivable. And then when it by and by gets into selfish hands, as it is always bound to do, it means death to human liberty and paralysis to human thought. All mines were royal property, and there were a good many of them. They had formerly been worked as savages always work mines, holes scrubbed in the earth and the mineral brought up in sacks of hide by hand at the rate of a ton a day. <clears throat> but I had begun to put the mining on a scientific basis as early as I could. Yes, I had made pretty handsome progress when Sir Sagramore's challenge struck me. Four years rolled by, and then, well, you would never imagine it in the world. Unlimited power is the ideal thing when it is in safe hands. The despotism of heaven is the one absolutely perfect government. An earthly despotism would be the absolutely perfect earthly government if the conditions were the same, namely the despot, the perfectest individual of the human race, and his lease of life, life perpetual. But as a perishable perfect man must die and leave his despotism in the hands of an imperfect su successor, an earthly despotism is not merely a bad form of government, it is the worst form that is possible. <clears throat> My work showed what a despot could do with the resources of a kingdom at his command. Unsuspected by this dark land, I had the civilization of the 19th century booming under its very nose. It was fenced away from the public view, but there it was, a gigantic and unassailable fact, and to be heard from, yet, if I lived and had luck. There it was, as sure a fact and as substantial a fact as any serene volcano, standing innocent with its smokeless summit in the blue sky and giving no sign of the rising hell in its bowels. My schools and churches were children four years before. They were grown up now. My shops of that day were vast factories now. Where I had a dozen trained men then, I had a thousand now. Where I had one brilliant expert then, I had 50 now. I stood with my hand on the cock, so to speak, ready to turn it on and flood the midnight world with light at any moment. But I was not going to do the thing in that sudden way. It was not my policy. 
the people could not have stood it. And moreover, I should have had the established Roman Catholic Church on my back in a minute. No, I had been going cautiously all the while. I had had confidential agents trickling through the country some time, whose office was to undermine knighthood by imperceptible degrees, and to gnaw a little at this and that and the other superstition, and so prepare the way gradually for a better order of things. I was turning on my light one candle power at a time, and meant to continue to do so. I had scattered some branch schools secretly about the kingdom, and they were doing very well. I meant to work this racket more and more as time wore on, if nothing occurred to frighten me. One of my deepest secrets was my West Point, my military academy. I kept that most jealously out of sight, and I did the same with my naval academy, which I had established at a remote seaport. Both were prospering to my satisfaction. <clears throat> Clarence was 22 now, and was my head executive, my right hand. He was a darling. He was equal to anything. There wasn't anything he couldn't turn his hand to. Of late, I had been training him for journalism, for the time seemed about right for a start in the newspaper line. Nothing big, but just a small weekly for experimental circulation in my civilization nurseries. He took to it like a duck. There was an editor concealed in him, sure. Already he had doubled himself in one way. He talked 6th century and wrote 19th. His journalistic style was climbing steadily. It was already up to the back settlement Alabama mark and couldn't be told from the editorial output of that region either by matter or flavor. We had another large departure on hand too. This was a telegraph and a telephone, our first venture in this line. These wires were for private service only as yet and must be kept private until a riper day should come. We had a gang of men on the road working mainly by night. They were stringing ground wires. We were afraid to put up poles, for they would attract too much inquiry. Ground wires were good enough in both instances, for my wires were protected by an insulation of my own invention, which was perfect. My men had orders to strike across country, avoiding roads and establishing connection with any considerable towns whose lights betrayed their presence, and leaving experts in charge. <clears throat> Nobody could tell you how to find any place in the kingdom, for nobody ever went intentionally to any place, but only struck it by accident in his wanderings, and then generally left it without thinking to inquire what its name was. At one time and another, we had sent out topographical expeditions to survey and map the kingdom, but the priests had always interfered and raised trouble, so we had given the thing up for the present. It would be poor wisdom to antagonize the church." As for the general condition of the country, it was as, as it had been when I arrived in it, to all intents and purposes. I had made changes, but they were necessarily slight, and they were not noticeable. Thus far, I had not even meddled with taxation outside of the taxes which provided the royal revenues. I had systematized those and put the service on an effective and righteous basis. As a result, these revenues were already quadrupled, and yet the burden was so much more equitably distributed than before that all the kingdom felt a sense of relief and the praises of my admiration were hearty and general. Personally, I struck an interruption now, but I did not mind it. It could not have happened at a better time." Earlier, it could have annoyed me, but now everything was in good hands and swimming right along. The king had reminded me several times of late that the postponement I had asked for four years before had about run out now. <clears throat> it was a hint that I ought to be starting out to seek adventures and get up a reputation of a size to make me worthy of the honor of breaking a lance with Sir Sagramore, who was still out grailing, but was being hunted for by various relief expeditions and might be found any year now. So you see, I was expecting this interruption. It did not take me by surprise. Chapter 11, The Yankee in Search of Adventures. There never was such a country for wandering liars, and they were of both sexes. Hardly a month went by without one of these tramps arriving, and generally loaded with a tale about some princess or other wanting help to get her out of some faraway castle where she was held in captivity by a lawless scoundrel, usually a giant. Now, you would think that the first thing the king would do after listening to such a novelette from an entire stranger would be to ask for credentials. Yes, and a pointer or two as to locality of castle, best route to it, and so on. But nobody ever thought of so simple and common sense a thing as that. No, everybody swallowed these people's lies whole and never asked a question of any sort or about anything. Well, one day when I was not around, one of these people came along. It was a she-one this time, and told a tale of the usual pattern. 
Her mistress was a captive in a vast and gloomy castle, along with 44 other young and beautiful girls, pretty much all of them princesses. They had been languishing in that cruel captivity for 26 years. The masters of the castle were three stupendous brothers, each with four arms and one eye, the eye in the center of the forehead, and as big as a fruit. Sort of fruit not mentioned, their usual slovenliness in statistics. Would you believe it? The king and the whole round table were in raptures over this preposterous opportunity for adventure. Every knight of the table jumped for the chance and begged for it, but to their vexation and chagrin, the king conferred it upon me, who had not asked for it at all. By an effort, I contained my joy when Clarence brought me the news, but he, he could not contain his. His mouth gushed delight and gratitude and a steady discharge, delight in my good fortune, gratitude to the king for this splendid mark of his favor for me. He could neither... He could keep neither his legs nor his body still, but pirouetted about the place in an airy ecstasy of happiness. On my side, I could have cursed the kindness that conferred upon me this benefaction, but I kept my vexation under the surface for policy's sake and did what I could to let on to be glad. Indeed, I said I was glad, and in a way it was true. I was glad as a person is when he is scalped. Well, one must make the best of things and not waste time with useless fretting, but get down to business and see what can be done. In all lies, there is wheat among the chaff. I must get at the wheat in this case, so I sent for the girl and she came. She was a comely enough creature and soft and modest, but if signs went for anything, she didn't know as much as a lady's watch. I said, my dear, have you been questioned as to particulars? She said she hadn't. <clears throat> well, I didn't expect you had, but I thought I would ask to make sure. It's the way I've been raised. Now, you mustn't take it unkindly if I remind you that as we don't know you, we must go a little, a little slow. You may be all right, of course, and we'll hope that you are, but to take it for granted isn't business. You understand that. I'm obliged to ask you a few questions. Just answer up fair and square and don't be afraid. Where do you live when you are at home? In the land of motor, fair sir. Land of motor. I don't remember hearing of it before. Parents living? As to that, I know not if they be yet on on live, sith it is many years that I have lain shut up in the castle. Your name, please? I'm the Demoiselle Alessandra de Cartelois, and it please you. Do you know anybody here who can identify you? That were not likely, fair lord, I being come hither now for the first time. Have you brought any letters, any documents, any proofs that you are trustworthy and truthful? Of a surety, no, and wherefore should I? Have I not a tongue, and cannot I say all that myself? But you're saying it, you know, and somebody else is saying it is different. Different? How might that be? I fear me, I do not understand. Don't understand, land of, why, you see, you see, why, great Scott, can't you understand a little thing like that? Can't you understand the difference between your, why do you look so inno innocent and idiotic? I, in truth, I know not, but an it were the will of God. Yes, yes, I reckon that's about the size of it. Don't mind my seeming excited. I'm not. Let us change the subject. Now, as to this castle with 45 princesses in it and three ogres at the head of it, tell me, where is this harem? Harem? The castle, you understand. Where is the castle? Oh, as to that, it is great and strong and well be seen and lieth in a far country. Yes, it is, it is many leagues. How many? Ah, fair sir, it were woundily hard to tell. They are so many, and do so lap the one upon the other, and being made all in the same image, and tincted with the same color, one may not know the one league from its fellow, nor how to count them, except they be taken apart, and ye wit well it were God's work to do that, being not within man's capacity. For you will note, hold on, hold on, never mind about the distance. Whereabouts does the castle lie? What's the direction from here? Ah, please you, sir, it hath no direction from here, by reason that the road lieth not straight, but turneth evermore, wherefore the direction of its place abideth not, but it is sometime under the one sky, and anon under another, whereso if ye be minded that it is in the east, and wend thitherward, ye shall observe that the way of the road doth yet again turn upon itself by the space of half a circle, and this marvel happening again, and yet again, and still again, it will grieve you that you have thought by vanities of the mind to thwart and bring to naught the will of him that giveth not a castle a direction from the place except it pleaseth him, and if it please him not, will the rather that even all castles and all directions thereunto vanish out of the earth, leaving the places wherein they tarry desolate and, and vacant, so warning his creatures that where he will, he will, and where he will not, he... Oh, that's all right. That's all right. Give us a rest. Never mind about the direction. Hang the direction. 
I beg pardon. I beg a thousand pardons. I am not well today. Pay no attention when I soliloquize. It is an old habit, an old bad habit, and hard to get rid of when one's digestion is all disordered with eating food that was raised forever and ever before he was born. Good land. A man can't keep his functions regular on spring chickens 1,300 years old. But come, never mind about that. Let's... Have you got such a thing as a map of that region about you? Now, a good map. Is it peradventure that manner of thing which of late the unbelievers have brought from over the great seas, which being boiled in oil and an onion and salt added thereto doth... What? A map? What are you talking about? Don't you know what a map is? There, there, never mind. Don't explain. I hate explanations. They fog a thing up so that you can't tell anything about it. Run along, dear. Good day. Show her the way, Clarence. Oh, well, it was reasonably plain now why these donkeys didn't prospect these liars for details. It may be that this girl had a fact in her somewhere, but I don't believe you could have sluiced it out with a hydraulic, nor got it with the earlier forms of blasting even. It was a case for dynamite. Why, she was a perfect ass, and yet the king and his knights had listened to her as if she had been a leaf out of the gospel. It's kind of sizes up the whole party. And think of the simple ways of this court. This wandering wench hadn't any more trouble to get access to the king and his palace than she would have had to get into the poorhouse in my day and country. In fact, he was glad to see her, glad to hear her tale. With that adventure of hers to offer, she was as welcome as a corpse is to a coroner. Just as I was ending up these reflections, Clarence came back. I remarked upon the barren result of my efforts with the girl, hadn't got hold of a single point that could help me to find the castle. The youth looked a little surprised or puzzled or something and intimated that he had been wondering to himself what I had wanted to ask the girl all those questions for. Why, great guns, I said. Don't I want to find the castle and how else would I go about it? La, sweet your worship, one may lightly answer that, I ween. She will go with thee. They always do. She will ride with thee. Ride with me? Nonsense. But of a truth she will. She will ride with thee. Thou shalt see. What? She browse around the hills and scour the woods with me alone, and I as good as engaged to be married? Why, it's scandalous. Think how it would look. My, the dear face that rose before me. The boy was eager to know all about this tender matter. I swore him to secrecy and then whispered her name. Puss Flanagan. He looked disappointed and said he didn't remember the countess. How natural it was for the little courtier to give her a rank. He asked me where she lived. In East Hart... I came to myself and stopped, a little confused. Then I said, never mind now, I'll tell you sometime. And might he see her? Would I let him see her some day? It was but a little thing to promise, 1,300 years or so, and he so eager. So I said yes. But I sighed. I couldn't help it, and yet there was no sense in sighing, for she wasn't born yet. But that is the way we are made. We don't reason where we feel. We just feel. My expedition was all the talk that day and that night, and the boys were very good to me and made much of me and seemed to have forgotten their vexation and disappointment and come to be as anxious for me to hide those ogres and set those ripe old virgins loose as if it were themselves that had the contract. Well, they were good children, but just children, that is all. And they gave me no end of points about how to scout for giants and how to scoop them in. And they told me all sorts of charms against enchantments and gave me salves and other rubbish to put on my wounds. But it never occurred to one of them to reflect that if I was such a wonderful necromancer as I was pretending to be, I ought not to need salves or instructions or charms against enchantments, and least of all arms and armor on a foray of any kind, even, even against fire-spouting dragons and devils hot from perdition, let alone such poor adversaries as these I was after, these commonplace ogres of the back settlements. I was to have an early breakfast and start at dawn, for that was the usual way. But I had the demon's own time with my armor, and this delayed me a little. It is troublesome to get into, and there is so much detail. First, you wrap a layer or two of blanket around your body for a sort of cushion and to keep off the cold iron. Then you put on your sleeves and shirt of chain mail. These are made of small steel links woven together, and they form a fabric so flexible that if you toss your shirt onto the floor, it slumped in slumps into a pile like a peck of wet fish net. It is very heavy and is nearly the uncomfortablest material in the wor world for a nightshirt, yet plenty used, used it for that. Tax collectors and reformers and one-horse kings with a defective title and those sorts of people. Then you put on your shoes, flat boats roofed over with interleaving bands of steel, and screw your clumsy spurs into the heels. Next, you buckle your greaves on your legs and your 
creases on your thighs. Then come your back plate and your breastplate, and you begin to feel crowded. Then you hitch onto the breastplate, the half petticoat of broad overlapping bands of steel, which hangs down in front, but is scalloped out behind so you can sit down, and isn't any real improvement on an inverted coal scuttle, either for looks or for wear, or to wipe your hands on. Next, you belt on your sword. Then you put your stovepipe joints in onto your arms, your iron gauntlets onto your hands, your iron rat trap onto your head, with a rag of steel web hitched onto it to hang over the back of your neck, and there you are, snug as a candle in a candle mold. This is no time to dance. Well, a man that is packed away like that is a nut that isn't worth the cracking. There is so little of the meat when you get down to it by comparison with the shell. The boys helped me, or I never could have got in. Just as we finished, Sir Bedivere happened in, and I saw that, as like as not, I hadn't chosen the most convenient outfit for a long trip. How stately he looked, and tall and broad and grand. He had on his head a conical steel cask that only came down to his ears, and for visor had only a narrow steel bar that extended down to his upper lip and protected his nose, and all the rest of him, from neck to heel, was flexible chain mail, trousers and all but pretty much all of him was hidden under his outside garment, which of course was of chain mail, as I said, and hung straight from his shoulders to his ankles, and from his middle to the bottom, both before and behind, was divided, so that he could ride and let the skirts hang down on each side. He was going grailing, and it was just the outfit for it, too. I would have given a good deal for that ulster, but it was too late now to be fooling around. The sun was just up, the king and the court were all on hand to see me off and wish me luck, so it wouldn't be etiquette for me to tarry. You don't get on your horse yourself. No, if you tried it, you would get a, you would get disappointed. They carry you out just as they carry a sunstruck man to the drugstore and put you on and help you help get you to rights and fix your feet in the stirrups. And all the while, you do feel so strange and stuffy and like somebody else, like somebody that has been married on a sudden or struck by lightning or something like that and hasn't quite fetched around yet and is sort of numb and can't just get his bearings. Then they stood up the mast they called a spear in its socket by my left foot, and I gripped it with my hand. Lastly, they hung my shield around my neck, and I was all complete and ready to up anchor and get to sea. Everybody was as good to me as they could be, and a maid of honor gave me the stirrup cup her own self. There was nothing more to do now but for that damsel to get up behind me on a pillion, which she did, and put an arm or so around me to hold on. And so we started, and everybody gave us a goodbye and waved their handkerchiefs or helmets. And everybody we met, going down the hill and through the village, was respectful to us, except some shabby little boys on the outskirts. They said, oh, what a guy, and hove clods at us. In my experience, boys are all the same in all ages. They don't respect anything. They don't care for anything or anybody. They say, go up, bald head, to the prophet going his unoffending way in the gray of antiquity. They sass me in the holy gloom of the Middle Ages, and I had seen them act this I had seen them act the same way in Buchanan's ad administration. I remember because I was there and helped. The prophet had his bears and settled with his boys, and I wanted to get down and settle with mine, but it wouldn't answer, because I couldn't have got up again. I hate a country without a Derrick. Chapter 12. Slow Torture Straight off, we were in the country. It was most lovely and pleasant in those sylvan solitudes in the early cool morning and the first freshness, freshness of autumn. From hilltops, we saw fair green valleys lying spread out below, with streams winding through them and island groves of trees here and there, and huge lonely oaks scattered about and casting back black blots of shade. And beyond the valleys, we saw the ranges of hills, blue with haze, stretching away in billowy perspective to the horizon, with at wide intervals a dim fleck of white or gray on a wave summit which we knew was a castle. We, we crossed broad natural lawns sparking with dew and we moved like spirits, the cushioned turf giving out no sound of footfall. We dreamed along through glades in a mist of green light that got its tint from the sun-drenched roof of leaves overhead. And by our feet, the clearest and coldest of runlets went frisking and gossiping over its reefs and making a sort of whispering music comfortable to hear. And at times we left the world behind and entered into the solemn great deeps and rich gloom of the forest, where furtive wild things whisked and scurried by and were gone before you could even get your eye on the place where the noise was, and where only the earliest birds were turning out and getting to business with a song here and a quarrel yonder and a mysterious far-off hammering and drumming for worms, worms on a tree trunk away somewhere in the impenetrable remoteness of the woods. And by and by out we would swing again into the glare. 
About the third or fourth or fifth time that we swung out into the glare, it was along there somewhere, a couple of hours or so after sunup. It wasn't as pleasant as it, has been, as, it, as it had been. It was beginning to get hot. This was quite noticeable. We had a very long pull after that without any shade. Now it is curious how progressively little frets grow and multiply after they once get a start. Things which I didn't mind at all at first, I began to mind now, and more and more too all the time. The first 10 or 15 times I wanted my handkerchief, I didn't seem to care. I got along and said, never mind, it isn't any matter, and I dropped it out of my mind. But now it was different. I wanted it all the time. It was nag, 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 right along and no rest. I couldn't get it out of my mind. And so at last I lost my temper and said, hang a man that would make a suit of armor without any pockets in it. You see, I had my handkerchief and my helmet and some other things, but it was that kind of a helmet that you can't take off by yourself. That hadn't occurred to me when I put it there. And in fact, I didn't know it. I supposed it would be particularly convenient there. And so now the thought of its being there, so handy and close by and yet not get atable, made it all the worse and the harder to bear. Yes, the thing that you can't get at is the thing you, that you want mainly. Everyone has noticed that. Well, it took my mind off from everything else, took it clear off and centered it in my helmet. And mile after mile there it stayed, imagining the handkerchief, picturing the handkerchief. And it was bitter and aggravating to have the salt sweat keep trickling down into my eyes and I couldn't get at it. It seems like a little thing on paper, but it was not a little thing at all. It was the most real kind of misery. I would not say it if it was not so. I made up my mind that I would carry along a reticule next time, let it look how it might, and people say what they would. Uh, <clears throat> of course, these iron dudes of the round table would think it was scandalous and maybe raise Sheol about it, but as for me, give me comfort first and style afterward. So we jogged along, and now and then we struck in a stretch of dust, and it would tumble up in clouds and get into my nose and make me sneeze and cry, and of course I said things I oughtn't to have said. I don't deny that. I am not better than others. We couldn't seem to meet anybody in this lonesome Britain, not even an ogre, and in the mood I was in then, it was well for the ogre, that is, an ogre with a handkerchief. Most knights would have thought of nothing but getting his armor." but so I got his bandana. He could keep his hardware for all of me. Meantime, it was getting hotter and hotter in there. You see, the sun was beating down and warming up the iron more and more all the time. Well, when you are hot that way, every little thing irritates you. When I trotted, I rattled like a crate of dishes, and that annoyed me. And moreover, I couldn't seem to stand that shield slatting and banging now about my breast, now about my back. And if I dropped into a walk, my joints creaked and screeched in that wearisome way that a wheelbarrow does, and as we didn't create any breeze at that gate, I was like to get fried in that stove. And besides, the quieter you went, the heavier the iron settled down on you, and the more and more tons you seemed to weigh every minute. And you had to be always changing hands and passing your spear over to the other foot. It got so irksome for one hand to hold it long at a time. Well, you know, when you perspire that way in rivers, there comes a time when you, when you, well, when you itch. You are inside, your hands are outside, so there you are nothing but iron between. It is not a light thing, let it sound as it may. First it is one place, then another, then some more, and it goes on spreading and spreading, and at last the territory is all occupied, and nobody can imagine what you feel like, nor how unpleasant it is. And when it had got to the worse, and it seemed to me that I could not stand anything more, a fly got in through the bars and settled on my nose, and the bars were stuck and wouldn't work, and I couldn't get the visor up, and I could only shake my head, which was baking hot by this time, and the fly, well, you know how a fly acts when he has got a certainty. He only minded the shaking enough to change from nose to lip and lip to ear and buzz and buzz all around in there and keep on lighting and biting in a way that a person already so distressed as I was simply could not stand. So I gave in and got Alessandra to unship the helmet and relieve me of it. Then she emptied the conveniences out of it and fetched it full of water and I drank and then stood up and she poured the rest down inside the armor. One cannot think how refreshing it was. She continued to fetch and pour until I was well soaked and thoroughly comfortable. It was good to have a rest and peace. But nothing is quite perfect in this life at any time. I had made a pipe a while back and also some pretty fair tobacco. Not the real thing, but what some of the Indians use. The inside bark of the willow dried. These comforts had been in the helmet, and now I had them again, but no matches. Gradually, as the time wore along, one annoying fact was borne in upon my understanding, that we were weather-bound, and ar an armed novice cannot mount his horse without help and plenty of it. Sandy was not enough, not enough for me anyway. We had to wait until somebody should come along. 
Waiting in silence would have been agreeable enough, for I was full of matter for reflection and wanted to give it a chance to work. I wanted to try and think out how it was that rational or even half-rational men could ever have learned to wear armor considering its inconveniences, and how they had managed to keep up such a fashion for generations when it was plain that what I had suffered today they had had to suffer all the days of their lives. I wanted to think that out, and moreover I wanted to think out some way to reform this evil and persuade the people to let the foolish fashion die out. But thinking was out of the question in the circumstances. You couldn't think where Sandy was. She was quite a biddable creature and good-hearted, but she had a flow of talk that was as steady as a mill and made your head soar like the drays and wagons in a city. If she had had a cork, she would have been a comfort, but you can't cork that kind. They would die. Her clack was going all day, and you would think something would surely happen to her works by and by. But no, they never got out of order, and she never had to slack up for words. She could grind and pump and churn and buzz by the week and never stop to oil up or blow out. And yet the result was just nothing but wind. She never had any ideas, any more than a fog has. She was a perfect blatherskite. I mean, jaw... I mean, for jaw, 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 talk, 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 jabber, 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 but just as good as she could be. I hadn't minded her mill that morning on account of having that hornet's nest of other troubles, but more than once in the afternoon I had to say, take a rest, child. The way you are using up all the domestic air, the kingdom will have to go to importing it by tomorrow, and it's a low enough treasury without that. We'll stop there and start next time with chapter 13. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.